Hello and welcome back to my channel. I recently watched the film Helter Skelter and I was entirely blown away by the profoundness of this film and all of the topics that it managed to comment on. Um, firstly, let's get it out of the way. If you are unfamiliar with this film, no, it has no relation to the song by the Beatles or Charles Manson. Also, if I happen to mispronounce any names or words in this video, I'm sorry in advance. Helter Skelter is a 2012 psychological horror film directed by Mika Ninagawa. The film is based on a 90s manga by the same name written by Kyoko Okazaki. Kyoko Okazaki has often been referred to as the mother of Sojao, a genre of manga aimed at adult female audiences. Okazaki covered many taboo topics within her work, such as prostitution addiction, and depression. In Helter Skelter, Okazaki exposes the obsession, jealousy, and deprivation caused by the desire to acquire beauty and the overpowering economic and commercial circumstances surrounding such desire. The manga and film follows top star Liliko, who has undergone cosmetic surgeries on her entire body. As her surgeries begin to show side effects, her perception of herself quickly begins to warp. As she struggles with her fragile image of herself, she makes the lives of those around her miserable as she copes with the difficulties in her career and personal life. The director of the film, Mika Ninagawa, said this, I am a big fan of Kyoko Okazaki, the manga artist who created it. She's very good at expressing women's real emotion, and this one reveals their strengths and weaknesses. So I thought I had to direct it. I didn't want to give it to anyone else, especially not a male director. The story is about a star who has had full body cosmetic surgery. That's how much she wants to be beautiful. I think this obsession is something that only women understand. It's not just about wanting to be beautiful for men. It's more than that an obsession that we all have. This film touches on the impossible and never-ending pursuit of beauty, the way in which the pursuit of beauty can poison your spirit as it is ever so fleeting. Liliko is praised as one of the most beautiful women in the world. Her image graces the cover of every top magazine. She stars in film and television series. She has wealth, status, fame, beauty. To anyone, she would seemingly have the perfect life. Although, beneath Lily Ko's beautiful surface lies an ugly secret. She has undergone extreme full-body plastic surgery to attain the perfect body and face. Her manager, Hiroko Tara, states, The only thing that's hers is her eyeballs, her ears, her fingernails, and her pussy. However, her body begins to break down from the treatments, and large bruise-like marks begin to appear on her skin causing Liliko to emotionally spiral. This bruising effect is an intentional design by the plastic surgery clinic. They grant women the bodies and faces of their wildest dreams, but the price they must pay is hefty. In order to maintain this perfect body, they must consistently come back for touch-up treatments. Otherwise, the body will begin to rot. This, of course, is very expensive and leaves an incredible financial burden on the women of whom get this procedure. And Lily Ko is not the only woman driven to insanity by the side effect of the clinic. Multiple women are soon found dead due to suicide, all of whom have the bruising on their bodies, and all of whom attended the same clinic as Lily Ko. Unable to sustain the consistent payments and upkeep required by the clinic, the women grow depressed and desperate. The multiple suicides of women who went to this clinic spark the beginning of a private investigation of the clinic, in which Liliko soon becomes a subject of interest of the investigators as someone who may be getting these mysterious procedures. This strategy that the plastic surgery clinic uses in order to keep clients coming back for consistent upkeep parallels the business strategy within capitalism referred to as planned obsolescence. To quote economy expert Will Kenton, planned obsolescence is the calculated act of making sure the existing version of a product will become dated or useless within a given time frame. This proactive move guarantees that consumers will seek replacements in the future, thus bolstering demand. 
The company who I would say is most famous for and often criticized for using this business strategy is Apple. In the past, where phone brands like Nokia made phones so indestructible that it has become a meme at this point, Apple products are known for their fragility. After a few years of owning an iPhone, it's not uncommon for the screen to smash, for the phone to just stop working, or if you manage to keep it alive, it ceases to be compatible with iOS updates, eventually forcing you to update your phone. There is also a culture surrounding the, the perceived elevated social status of having the newest iPhone, further enticing you to update your phone even if it is working perfectly fine. This idea of planned obsolescence is actually being used in real-life plastic surgery clinics as well. We see this in the form of procedures such as buckle fat removal, a surgery that removes the buckle fat from your face to give you the appearance of defined, model-like cheekbones. Though because buckle fat is actually the only fat within our face that we don't lose with age and weight loss, as one continues to age, their appearance may become gaunt and cause one's face to age more rapidly than before. And as we are a society that glamorizes youth to a toxic point, this will require one to eventually get filler in order to regain some semblance of youth. Remember, what looks good now may not look good in 10 years, 15 years. The buckle fat pad is fat that doesn't reduce and change over time. It actually stays very consistent, and that's what many MRI studies have shown over the years. The rest of the fat in our face tends to atrophy and reduce. That's why people get fat transferred to the face, you know, coupled with facelifts and things like that later in life. So if you're removing fat that is actually going to be with you for a long, long time, what happens later on is that then the face just overall looks way too hollow and, and gaunt. You know, and that's the problem with the buckle fat removal over time. Additionally, procedures like filler and Botox are not one-off procedures. If you get these done and like the results, this is now this now becomes a bi-yearly expense in order to maintain one's desired appearance. The plastic surgery clinic within the film intentionally uses planned obsolescence because they know it will work. They prey on women who are incredibly insecure and give them the body of their dreams. They give these women a taste of the euphoria in being conventionally beautiful and desired. They know that once these women experience this, they will be hooked, like a drug. And as the bruises start to appear and the euphoria fades with their fading beauty, they will do whatever it takes to return to that high. Lilico actually echoes this sentiment when she talks about makeup. This is mirrored within real-life clinics as well, because plastic surgery is firstly a business. Many of my friends have gone to get a simple procedure such as lip filler, and when they are at the clinic, the people who work there will begin to point out additional so-called flaws within their client. You may have just went in for lip filler, but now you are being told that you should do something about the crow's feet beginning to form around your eyes. Or what about that wrinkle on your forehead? It is not uncommon for clinics to use this strategy to upsell because they know that most women who go to these clinics are often already at least mildly insecure because they are getting modifications and they use this insecurity to their advantage to make more money. Though of course this is not all clinics and not all plastic surgeons do this, but it is a practice amongst many clinics. This film also addresses the torment in growing older as a woman. When we meet Lily Ko, she is at the top of her game. She is the most beautiful and most celebrated supermodel in Japan. She is seemingly untouchable. Until one day, her manager introduces her to Koza Yashikawa, a young model whose natural beauty and friendly demeanor quickly garner her enough attention to be a threat to Lily Ko. And to make matters worse, 
Koza is only 18 years old. As Liliko grapples with this idea of being replaced, as her looks fade before her eyes in the form of various bruises, she begins to slip into insanity. The young girl becomes demonetized when she goes out of circulation. When she loses the possibility of re-entering the marketplace, she begins to rot. No matter how charismatic, charming, and beautiful Liliko is, there will always be a younger, more beautiful girl around the corner waiting to take her spot. I worked in the modeling industry since I was a young teenager, and I was consistently reminded of this fact. We were always reminded how disposable we were and how by the age of 25, we would be considered washed up and old by modeling standards. The patriarchal culture has instilled a planned obsolescence in a woman's worth. Since the day a girl is born, she is given a shelf life and an expiry date. Young women are discarded as rotten before they are ripe. Whilst men have their entire lives to cultivate their legacy and come into their prime, as a man's success is more defined by their wealth, status, and their career, things that can be built over the course of one's lifetime. The brilliant Susan Sontag expressed this in her essay, The Double Standard of Aging. For women, only one standard of female beauty is sanctioned, the girl. The great advantage men have is that our culture allows two standards of male beauty, the boy and the man. The beauty of a boy resembles the beauty of a girl. In both sexes, it is a fragile kind of beauty and flourishes naturally only in the early part of the life cycle. Happily, men are able to accept themselves under another standard of good looks, heavier, rougher, and more thickly built. A man does not grieve when he loses the smooth, unlined, hairless skin of a boy, for he has only exchanged one form of attractiveness for another. The darker skin of a man's face, roughened by daily shaving, showing the marks of emotion and the normal lines of age. There is no equivalent of the second standard for women. The single standard of beauty for women dictates that they must go on having clear skin. Every wrinkle, every line, every gray hair is a defeat. No wonder that no boy minds becoming a man. While even the passage from girlhood to early womanhood is experienced by many women as their downfall, for all women are trained to continue wanting to look like girls. Paulina Poriskova echoes the same sentiment as Susan Sontag. I know that you've said we've lost touch of what real age looks like. Do you believe that's because of social media? What do you believe is the reason why? Oh, well, I'm not sh I'm not exactly sure that it's because of social media, but I do think it's because of media in general. I do think that uh, women uh, a certain age uh, in the media are represented as looking at permanent 39. Uh, the actresses, news anchors, uh, everybody that you see in the media is an incredible looking whatever age they are, but they that always translates to they look younger. It's not that they look 55, they look amazing because they look 39 while they are 55. So I do think that women that look their age, who actually represent their age, that have the wrinkles and move their faces and, you know, not everything is firm, uh, there's a much less of a representation and it's a lot less celebrated because aging, um, actually visibly aging, I guess is is nothing to celebrate. Uh, making it look like you're not aging is what seems to be uh, celebra celebration worthy. Women have been historically taught within many societies that our worth is intrinsically tied to our youth and beauty. I remember as early as my teens writing journal entries about feeling as though I was running out of time. Lilico echoes the same fear of running out of time in her opening. And additionally, we see Lilico throughout the film 
being somewhat haunted by this imagery of clocks, further emphasizing her fear of running out of time. We see this planned obsolescence in the way men like Leonardo DiCaprio refuse to date women over the age of 25, ready to discard them as their birthday approaches and replace them with a newer, younger girl, as if they are just getting the latest iPhone. The fact that women must worry about aging before all their teeth have grown in is dystopian. (laughs) Nothing in the identity of the young girl truly belongs to her, even less her youth than her femininity. She does not possess attributes. Instead, her attributes possess her, those they have generously loaned to her. The young girl chases after health as if it were salvation. The sense of the self as meat as the heap of an organ, variously filled with ovaries or flanked by balls, is the basis from which emerge the aspiration and finally the failure of the young girl to give herself form, or at the very least, to simulate one. As Lily Ko has tasted what it feels like to be on top, to be the most beautiful, desired woman, the idea of falling from this pedestal torments her. She returns again and again to the plastic surgery clinic, desperately grasping to her beauty that seems to always be fleeting. As Liliko is haunted by the thought of being ugly again, she begins to numb her fear with drugs and lash out at those around her, especially her assistant Hada, whom she grows abusive towards. In her pursuit of and the obsession with beauty, she progressively loses touch with reality. There has been a huge surge in recent years of women getting Botox and other anti-aging procedures as early as their 20s, making the commentary within this film more relevant than ever. According to the American Academy of Facial Plastic and Reconstructive Surgery, Gen Z is booking cosmetic procedures at higher rates than before, and 75% of surgeons in the U.S. said that they saw a spike in clients under 30 in 2022. Young women desperately find refuge in the offices of plastic surgeons, seeking sanctuary from the ever-creeping claws of aging and time. Women have been taught to fear wilting before they have bloomed. Many have theorized that the spike in people, especially young people, getting plastic surgery is due to the access of images and videos that we are constantly consuming on social media. Whether we are conscious of it or not, we are now more than ever consistently comparing ourselves to the lives and beauty of others. I never felt more insecure about myself than when I was on TikTok, as the algorithm bombarded me with videos of the most beautiful women I have ever seen, and I am not someone to be easily consumed by comparison, and yet I found myself growing terribly insecure. Susan Sontag stated in her book on photography, needing to have reality confirmed and experience enhanced by photographs is an aesthetic consumerism to which everyone is now addicted. Industrial societies turn their citizens into image junkies. It is the most irresistible form of mental pollution. Poignant longings for beauty for an end to probing below the surface, for a redemption and celebration of the body of the world. All these elements of erotic feelings are affirmed in the pleasure we take in photographs. But other, 
less liberating feelings are expressed as well. The fact that Sontag wrote this in the 70s completely blows me away because this assessment of aesthetic consumerism has only become increasingly relevant with time. This feeling of insecurity and comparison is seen elevated in Lilico, where beyond just feeling insecure and altering her appearance, she becomes willing to deform the bodies of other women who threaten her. When her boyfriend breaks off their engagement to be with another woman, Lilico manipulates her assistant Hada and her assistant's boyfriend to throw acid on the woman's face, thus disfiguring her. And as Koza is increasingly seen as a threat to Lilico's stardom, Lilico convinces Hara to disfigure Koza as well. Though Koza spots Hara with the box cutter in hand and ready to disfigure Koza's face. And to Hara's surprise, Koza urges Hara to do it, to disfigure her face. She states, <laughs> Possessing a self-awareness that Liliko lacks. As Koza states this, Liliko can be seen on a talk show where they are celebrating her birthday and in the middle of blowing out her birthday cake, Lilico begins to hallucinate, seemingly having a bad trip from the drug she's been taking. As Koza's words play over Lilico's breakdown, it becomes prevalent that Lilico's breakdown is a manifestation of her suppressed fear of aging and falling from public favor. As Koza said, they are all bound to be forgotten and replaced, a fact that Lilico is in denial over. For it is not Koza or Liliko that is celebrated, but rather the desires that manifest from looking at them. And once they fail to instill desire, they will be replaced. <laughs> The young girl is the commodity that insists on being consumed at every instant because at every instant, she becomes more obsolete. Another element of plastic surgery and beauty that is highlighted within Helter Skelter is the idea that there is a damned if you do, damned if you don't aspect to the way our culture responds to plastic surgery. In our society, if you are anything but a naturally beautiful woman, you are viewed as a problem or a burden. At this point, most of us have been familiarized with the concept of pretty privilege and the way it grants you opportunities those who do not fit into the conventional standards of beauty do not have access to. This is evident in the way people treat Lilico. Her beauty has granted her wealth and status, things that she likely would not have had access to prior to plastic surgery. And despite her cruelty towards others, they blindly obey her as if under the spell of her beauty. If you don't fit into society's standards of beauty, you are treated as though you are a lesser human. Though if you decide to modify your face with plastic surgery procedures, you are also shamed for doing so and deemed fake. I have grown up seeing memes of Kylie Jenner's before and after photos of when she got plastic surgery, and in statements of incredible hypocrisy and contradiction, people simultaneously call her before photos ugly whilst shaming her for getting the plastic surgery and calling her after photos fake. And what is especially troubling is the photos in which they are comparing and calling ugly, Kylie is a teenager. I'm not even advocating for or against plastic surgery, I just feel as women, we are under an intense microscope no matter what we decide to do. Be beautiful, but only naturally so. Wear makeup, but not too much. Oh, you don't fit the conventional standards of beauty? Prepare to be treated less than. Oh, you're a woman with wrinkles? You're an old hag. Oh, you're an older woman without wrinkles? You obviously got Botox and are hanging too desperately onto your fleeting youth. Oh, you got plastic surgery to fit the conventional standards of beauty? You better lie about it or people will think you're fake and no one wants a girl who's fake. Oh, 
You did lie about your procedures, so you're fake and a liar. If you would have just been honest about your procedures, we wouldn't have cared. You're setting unrealistic expectations for everyone else. Damned if you do, damned if you don't. All these options in how we approach aging, but the ones that we are most shamed for is the way we look. If you have things done, then boo you because you're taking the easy way out and you're a rich bitch who can afford it. Or you don't do it and then you're like, Grandma, get some Botox. You're looking really haggard. There's like no way to win for a woman. If you choose to do something about the shame that's getting heaped on you by fixing your face, then you're going to get shamed for that. And if you don't do it, you're going to get shamed for that too. To me, it just made sense to try to eliminate the shame that I felt when people told me I was old and ugly rather than acquiesce to their desires and make myself look the way they think I should look. This is brilliantly highlighted within the film. When Liliko's assistant, Hada, grows tired of Liliko's consistent abuse, she leaks Liliko's before photos to the public, revealing Liliko's unrecognizable appearance before her full body plastic surgery. The press erupts in an uproar over the news. The teenage girls who we've seen praising her now turn on her, whom they had once sat around idolizing and praising for her beauty, they are now tearing down and calling her fake, as they criticize Lilico's pre-surgery appearance with the same hypocrisy people do online to celebrities such as Kylie Jenner, though they perpetuate the very cycle they criticize. They shame Lily Ko for being so-called ugly and jump from idolizing Lily Ko to Koza, thus further giving the culture that drove Lily Ko to get these procedures in the first place the power to continue. Lily Ko is unable to cope with the downfall of her image, her secret now being exposed to the world. <laughs> In an attempt to salvage Liliko's reputation, her manager hosts a press conference and prepares a speech for Liliko to say to the press. Liliko sits in silence as the flickers of the camera flashes persist. Without saying a word, Liliko holds up a knife and drives it into her eye. In an act of rebellion, Liliko frees herself from the gaze of the public. As she falls backwards, her body lays on the floor, seemingly lifeless. However vast her narcissism, the young girl does not love herself. What she loves is her image. That is something that is not only foreign and exterior to her, but that possesses her in the full sense of the word. The young girl lives under the tyranny of this ungrateful master. As the years go on, the plastic surgery clinic is revealed to still be under investigation, and more girls have died by suicide as a result of its practices. As time goes on, Liliko is still remembered, becoming a sort of urban legend of sorts. Though as she feared, and as Koza predicted, Koza replaces her as top model. In the end, Koza is seen partying at a club with many performers. She mysteriously spots Hada, Liliko's former assistant. Koza has a strange feeling and follows Hada down a corridor. She finds herself standing in an elaborately decorated dressing room, where a woman sits staring at herself in the vanity mirror. The woman turns. Liliko is alive, an eye patch on her eye, smiling. Overall, Helter Skelter is a film about a woman's descent into madness through the never-ending chase of her fleeting beauty. 
This film is a commentary on the way in which capitalism and consumerism wraps its greedy hands around the body and minds of women, consuming our waking thoughts. This film brilliantly delves into the toxicity of our culture's obsession with youth and beauty and comments on the way in which our society's relationship with beauty and plastic surgery is entirely dangerous and yet hypocritical. I would love to know your thoughts on the film and the topics discussed below. If you disagree with anything I've said in this video or with anyone in the comment section, I encourage you to state your opinion with kindness and respect. If you are unable to communicate your feelings and opinions with respect, I will not hesitate to block you from my channel because I don't, I don't want to host hatred. <laughs> As always, thank you for watching. Bye.